Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Mentor Project. For those of you that are joining for the first time, I'm Dr. Susan Burnstone, and I am so grateful to be your host for this show and this series. And I am so excited that we have a very, very special mentor on today's show. And you are going to learn so much about so many things. So I have on the show with us, Bill Cheswick, also known as Ches. Welcome, Ches. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So I'm so excited to have you on and there's so much fun stuff we're gonna talk about and our audience is gonna learn so much. So I wanna first let them know a little bit about you because Ches is known for his early work in internet security, including firewalls, proxies, and he's a co-author of the first full book on firewalls. He is also noted for his work in visualizations, especially internet maps, which have appeared widely. Chess has also worked at Bell Labs and AT&T Shannon Lab, and he was a co-founder of Lumetta Corporation. He continues to invent, collaborate, write apps, hang out with grad students at the University of Pennsylvania, and he gives talks worldwide. He currently visits schools to teach advanced STEM concepts to grade schoolers, and he's a big part of the Mentor Project. And it's really a privilege to be able to uh, interview you and be in conversation with you today. Well, thank you, you're very kind. I should point out, I'm not giving any worldwide talks right now. Um, well, I'm here in the farm, like, you know, at home, like everyone else. I miss travel. Well, you're actually worldwide through this, right? You're Zooming in. Well, that's true. That's, that's it. true. It's not quite the same, but yeah. But people worldwide are getting still to be able to listen to you and cool. see you. So it's, it's great, right? And actually, cool. yeah. you're partly responsible for us being able to do this, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the firewall. Yeah. So why don't we start there? And then we'll talk about okay. the farmhouse because I'm really interested in, tell us about your work with the firewall. Some people know what that means, but a lot of people don't that are watching. So let's start there. Well, okay. Um, I got to Bell Labs in 1987, the end of the year. And I had figured at that time, hmm, this internet seems to be a coming thing. I should learn something about it. Now being sort of what we now call an IT guy, the, back then I was a system programmer, but it's sort of the same job. I looked around the labs and there was this thing, there was a firewall that Dave Prezado had built and there was email and the, the internet that was just starting. It, it was NSFNet and other things like that. Define, and I said, the define, way to learn this is... Define, yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Jack. Define firewall. Some people do not even know what firewall... Okay, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Great, um, okay. But, but I figured... I will start running this stuff so I can learn what's going on. And it turns out that's a right place at the right time sort of thing. Um, the firewall that, that Dave had and some other people had, I did not invent the firewall, um, was uh, it's something that lets you connect to the internet and lets the good stuff through and stops the bad stuff. Okay, think of a guard at a building. It's a lot like that, only really technical. And, um, this, uh, Dave had designed a firewall. He didn't trust anyone. Uh, you know, when the internet was first considered, everyone connected to everyone else. And uh, that wasn't such a great deal because frankly, the internet was and still is a bad neighborhood, mm. which means anyone could connect to you. So if you have a computer that can be attacked and you're on this original sort of wide open internet, someone could attack you and ruin your day. And the idea was, let's stop those attacks from coming in, let you go out to the internet and do stuff, stop the stuff coming in. And uh, that's what his firewall did. I started making some changes to it and learning about it and so on. About a year later, the Morris worm hit. And this, the worm is like, it's a virus actually, a, a piece of software that reproduces and goes to different machines and invades it. And it had some bugs in it. And the problem, with that sort of thing is it's exponential growth. And just like biological viruses, it can be too good at it. And what it would do would be keep reinfecting the same computers over and over again until they slowed down and stopped. 
So the internet all over the world was a mess, but it didn't get through our firewall. And I remember waking up that morning and someone had called and said, there's something wrong with the internet. And my first thought was, oh gosh, if it got through our firewall, I'm just going, to, I'm never going to hear the end of it. And I got into the labs and Dave, no, no, it was it, another researcher was on the phone saying, did you get it? We didn't get it. Neener, neener, neener. And our <laughs> firewall, mostly through design, had kept it out. There was one lucky part uh, about six months before I had found something in our firewall. I said, I don't know what this service is, but it's running with privileges. And that means if there's something wrong with it, we could be hacked. And it was sort of the end of the day. And I said, screw it. I don't know what it is. I'll just turn it off. And that was one of the doors that the worm used to get in. So what I realized was that was security by being lucky. And I, it started forming my thoughts about security. And I've been studying security a lot ever since. And I redesigned the firewall um, with really tightening it up a lot and maybe more than it needed to be, but that was good. And then, you know, I, I don't have a PhD, but a lot of the people at the labs did mm -hmm. and they were writing papers for stuff. And so I wrote a paper on what I had done. And uh, it actually, my, my firewall had two belt and suspenders. So if you got through one, you couldn't get through the second one. And there was one reviewer who said, well, you should just do 20 of them all together, stacked together. Anyway, I wrote a paper and I gave it to my boss, Fred Grant. And he read it and he said, this is a good paper. All right. And I submitted it to a conference and they accepted it. And so I gave my first big paper in 1990. Um, and then I started playing with hackers. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you've got a solid wall behind you, you can start asking questions. Who is out there and how are they trying to break in and what tools are they using? I can watch them. And so a, a bunch of us set up a variety of traps on the outside of the firewall, sort of like counting bugs on the windshield. You know, well, they might try to break in using this bug in this program. We'll put up something that looks like it's that program with that bug and have it report to us when things happen. And uh, some papers came out of that. And in particular, I actually, there was one hacker who uh, from the Netherlands who was breaking in all over the place and he started coming in there and I had set up a special outside place that seemed like they were coming in and breaking into the machine and then attacking the rest of the world. What they were doing was coming into the machine under control. I was watching everything they did. And so I could tell who they were attacking and how they were using it. It almost sounds so, like a computer. It sounds like a computer game, you know, like well, a lot of these. It, uh, it very much is like that. There. They're called honey pots. Uh, they're very popular now. This was one of the early ones. Um, I, there's a fellow named Cliff Stahl who originally did some work and wrote a great book about this. And he inspired me to say, well, I should go look at this and do a little more advanced work. So I got to watch this guy for a while. Now, there are a couple problems. First of all, I know who he's attacking. So I could come in and, and call those people and say, you're under attack. This machine has been broken into by this bad guy. And here's how he got in. And you might want to fix it. Okay, so that was all good. One of the places he tried to break in was US Army. And they came and had a little chat with me and said, your computer tried to attack us. I said, let me tell you what's going on here. You know, I have this, here's, here's what he did for attacking you, this is what I told you guys, and so on. Meanwhile, my management said, you know, our machine is technically attacking them, even though it's someone else. You've got to turn that off. So anyway, I had some fun toying with them and it then shut it off and I wrote up a paper and it, I had called this hacker Burford. I'm the sorry, what, what's the name? You Burford, B-E-R-F-E-R-D. -E -E I called him Burford and the paper was called An Evening with Burford in which a hacker is lured, endured, and studied. And I submitted Burford? that to- Where'd you get Burford? Hmm? What, where does Burford stand? Uh, the How Dick Van Dyke Show back around 1960 had Jerry Van Dyke come in and, and play the banjo and call his brother Burford. Why are you calling me Burford? Because you look like a Burford. So I called this hacker Burford. And if you go and do a web search for Burford, I think it may still be the first hit. Wow. Uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder where Dick Van Dyke got that from. I wonder where that originated from. Which well, it would be Jerry Van Dyke who actually said Jerry, it. Jerry, you know, yeah. that show had wonderful writers. It yeah. could have been 
I, and anyway, yes, Burford is the first hit uh, for Google. <laughs> An <laughs> evening in Burford. Anyway, the paper was accepted and published, and uh, that was my second paper. And at that point, I looked and said, you know, these firewalls are a new, new thing. Mm -hmm. And a whole, I knew most of the people in the world who knew about firewalls and worked on them. And I said, we really should take a bunch of these papers, put them together, and make a book out of it. And I went to my friend, Steve Bellavin, who had taught me quite a bit about the internet and was, went way back in internet technology. And uh, he, he'd been bugged by a, a uh, publisher. And he went to the publisher and said, we think this book would be good. And the publisher, and you know, we'll put these papers together. And the publisher said, the book is a great idea. You're not allowed to stay papers together. You've got to write it fresh. And for me, you know, I was never the best student in the world. And this was sort of like, you now have to write 15 English themes. And you know, I'm having flashbacks to fifth grade and so on. But the difference was, there are two differences. First of all, I knew mostly what I was talking about. Well, we need to say this and this and this and this. I don't know much about that. I've got to go study that. And I had a co-author. I'm not a big fan of reading my own writing right after I've written it. So I, the spirit would move me to spew out 25 paragraphs and I'd shoot it off. And the next morning it would be 40 paragraphs long with his changes and additions and stuff. And it would be interesting again. And it'd take us a couple of days, we'd ping pong a chapter back and forth. And we got that book done, it was 320 pages. Um, and it hit the market at exactly the right time. In fact, we had people, it was gonna come out in May, 1994. And we had people in February said, I can't wait till then. And we said, okay, wow. we'll send you a draft but you have to read it and get back to us in three days with corrections. And we did that several times. And the book ended up having only three typos in it, which is not bad for a 320 page technical book. That's great. And That's it, amazing. Yeah. It, it came out at a big conference, the same one that had the first commercial firewall and ended up selling a hundred thousand copies. And, you know, every once in a while I'd get a package in the mail that would be two copies of the book translated to some language I wasn't sure about. There are lots of accents. Is this Czech, you know, and, and you know, so on. So, you know, this is great. And I just want to shift for a minute because you mentioned the fifth grade. Yeah. Right? So yeah. in the fifth grade, you did not even know computers, they, you know, what were yet. Oh, and, no, no. And the the job, right. I, so what, yeah. like what, you know, because it's always interesting to think, you know, we're hearing a little bit about your major accomplishments. And, yeah. you know, when you How mentioned get there? Grade, How did you get there? Like what, but what did you, what were you like in fifth grade? What, what did you yeah, want to Yeah, I get this all then? the time. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this is one of the reasons I got into the mentor project because uh, in the late 1950s, Sputnik went up and the US said, oh my God, we got to learn science. We got to teach science. And I got caught up in that. So by fourth grade, it's fair to say that I was a science guy in the Bill Nye sense of the word. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was reading science and had chemistry sets and microscopes and a was telescope. Your, was, was your family into science? Was that no. anything in there? In there no, they, no. My, what, my parents what? said, where did this come from? Uh, I, I mean, if you want to look at it, my grandfather was an industrial engineer, if you think there was some sort of genetic connection. But no, I was just fascinated. I want to know about all of this. It also came from science fiction. And remember, this is the 60s. We had nuclear power, atom bombs. Uh, space, people were going into space. Oh my God, we had lasers and new drugs and DNA had just been discovered. And, and my God, the future was going to be terrific. And in fact, this is something I say these days, I love living in the future. This is what we were looking forward to. And really, it's extremely cool. There is so much great stuff. You know, this is, a, first of all, nobody, none of those science fiction authors, and I read them all, thought of anything like the internet. Really, the first one I saw was in the mid 70s. This computer right here, this iPhone has more power than the Cray we had at Bell Labs in 1990. And it costs under, well under a thousand bucks. Nobody guessed this would happen. Uh, it's just amazing to have this sort of stuff around here. So I wanted to know how things worked. I played with electronics. I wasn't always the best student, but I remember in sixth grade, my report card said, Bill probably knows more science than his science teacher. And I felt I was chuffed. That was just great. 
Now I look back at him and say, that was awful. What kind of school system would let someone interested in science not have what you could? Now, right. in seventh grade, I did have good science teachers and I had lousy science grades. I was busy with my own stuff. I didn't get along with that particular teacher very well. So this is tough. Um, but I think, you know, so, it's good. It's, and I think it's good for like a lot of kids and parents to know that kids don't always have yeah. to be perfect students and they can grow up and accomplish unbelievable things because it's really about, it's we, put, we put pressure on kids to uh, succeed and excel in ways that really, you know, might not d determine their future at all. So continue, it, it's please. It's true, um, but you know, so I am somewhat of an autodidact. I teach myself yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best teacher in the world for that, but that's how I learned a lot of this. And I was doing outrageous chemistry experiments by the time I was 12. You know, I was dealing with liquid bromine. Oh my wow. God. I, you know, <laughs> I have all my fingers. I didn't blow anything up. I didn't poison myself. I, my hair isn't full of mercury, but all of those things could have happened. I was careful. And in fact, well, I want to get back to this before about what you want to be when you grow up because right. telling my story here shows how random it could be. Because when I was uh, uh, at, in high school at Lawrenceville, I was going to be a chemist. And then 11th grade, I got in and the math building had a teletype in the corner. It was connected to a computer. And I said, hmm, computers are the wave of the future. I should learn a little about them. And Shaz, where, the, where is Lawrenceville? Where did you say it was? Lawrenceville's in New Jersey, down in by New Trenton. Jersey. So you grew up in yeah, New yeah, Jersey? Yeah, yeah, it's a fine okay. prep school down there. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, sh I should learn something about that. And uh, it was addictive as hell. <laughs> and I went crazy. When I went to Lehigh in 1970, I was mm -hmm. a chemistry major. But a year later, I realized I was spending all my time in the computing center and none of the time in the lab, and I must be trying to tell myself something. So I switched majors and got a degree in, get this, they didn't have computer science, fundamental science. Fundamental science. Uh, fundamental science in the School of Engineering. It's a BS. That sounds sort of like a BS degree. But it turns <laughs> out, first of all, the dean and I put together a lot of computer courses, electrical engineering, information science, and that sort of stuff. But it also turns out it's a degree in science guy. And I am probably as much a science guy as anything else. I've had training and classes in all kinds of stuff. And I, you know, I have piles, you can't see them here. I have piles of natures and sciences that I'm reading through and stuff. I, oncology, cosmology, all this stuff interests me. Um, so I got out of, I got out of college and I was in computing and I've been there ever since. And now that I'm retired, what am I doing? I'm learning how I, we have a train line here. I live on a farm now here in Flemington, New Jersey, and about a block or two that way is a major freight line. And I have set up a camera. It's connected to a laptop in the barn. And every time a train comes by, it takes a movie of the train. And I am working on taking that movie and stitching it together into one long picture of the train, finding the engine numbers, how fast the train is going, which direction, what is it carrying, maybe you know, who's driving it. I'm doing all of this because um, computer vision is an interesting field and it's a good thing to practice on. Wow. I'm also practicing. Yeah, I'm also doing the sound. That is uh, fantastic. Because, and I have, I have lots yeah. of questions for you about the farm, but before I go there, I want to just go back. Okay, to okay. Your I'll, childhood I'll, I'll back okay. up here. Yeah. There's, no, 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 it's great. Yeah. There's so much information yeah. and so much I want to know. And I know our viewers want okay. to hear this. Who, because we're talking, you know, you are a mentor and you're, you know, you're talking about mm -hmm. what you're, what you're looking at now and um, who are your mentors along the way? Um, there are a few science teachers who were remarkable and above average. Remember, I wasn't always a great student. So they're, you know, they're relating to me as best as they can. I'll tell you, I had a series of fabulous English teachers. And um, I never liked writing very much, certainly not when you were doing longhand. Oh my God, the cramps mm -hmm. and stuff. And then you type, so word processing is part of the future. Um, but it turns out, despite myself, I have had people who I really respect come up and say, Chez, how did you get to be such a good writer? And it's, what, I'm a good writer? Uh, and it clearly was those English teachers. 
so even it's, though it's, they wanted could, me to write. No, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. they wanted me to write on the deep hidden meaning in Moby Dick, and <laughs> you know that 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 English lit crit stuff, which I did not understand. I did not know what they wanted, um, but you know I sort of muddled along. It turns out, looking back, some advice I give to myself in seventh grade is go ahead and read a couple of um, what is that summary book that that series of books that instead of reading the book you read the summary. Um, uh, Oh, you're saying oh the cliff notes, the cliff notes, the cliff notes. Cliff notes. I cliff should notes. have read some cliff notes because I didn't know what these teachers wanted. And the cliff notes would talk about the deep hidden meaning and that sort of stuff. And I could at least look at it and say, oh, that's what they're looking for. I never did that. I've never read a cliff notes. I well, now, now, I don't think they use cliff notes. I think now you just Google it. Now we just Google everything, right? It's probably so true. Like, yeah. Right. So, sure the, the, so Google's right, right, yeah. right. It's the old cliff notes. But you know, it's interesting. Yeah, because, yeah. You know, kids don't realize, and you know, adults now, you don't know who your real mentors are sometimes until you look back and you think, oh, this person was yeah. my mentor. So especially as children and teens, well, you're not aware of well, who your mentors are. Right? There, there, yeah, there, there are some people, there was the guy up the road back when I was in fourth grade who gave me a box of his old college chemistry books. Okay, and he was surprised when I told him 35 years later that I read most of those cover to cover and was fascinated by them. Wow. You know, crazy. and he was surprised. Whoa, who knew that? Um, so, so that's part of it. Also at Bell Labs, I, was, I sat in the Unix room with, with many famous people. And there was one fellow there named Dave Prezado that I not only learned a lot about computing and so on, I also learned ha work habits. Um, you know, you got a problem, don't put it off, fix it right now. He would, Dave, this isn't working. He'd just spin right around and fix it. And by golly, when I have a problem, I, if I don't do that, I forget it. And um, that, you know, that's so important because, you know, you also talked about when you talked about the book, right? That you had a partner, yeah. you had a co-writer. And, and I think yes. that's something that we need to underline for, and underscore for our audience and for kids and even for young adults and old adults, right? It's so important yeah. that we work together with others, that we don't have to do this by ourselves. Well, remember in school, you're not allowed to do that on an English paper. Right. Or if you do, it's this awkward little group of people trying to collaborate. Uh, Steve Bellavin, my, my first co-author on all of this stuff, uh, he and I turned out interacted beautifully, communicated beautifully, and we had no ego in our, dry, our writing. You know, he, he would change stuff and I would change stuff. He uses too many semicolons. I'd, <laughs> I'd pull some of those out and you know, it was okay. And we also both had an informal uh, speaking uh, voice. What you're hearing now is my regular speaking voice. Mm -hmm. I write the same way. I gave a talk in Germany once and a guy came up afterwards and said, now that I've heard you speak, I know which parts of the book you wrote. Oh, that's very and, telling. And that's, yeah. That was fine. But we had to tell, you know, we had an editor who would go through and sort of clean things up. We called her the English teacher. We sort of imagined she was a 55 year old English teacher. Turns out we were pretty close. Um, the editor had to say, dial back the knob on being upset with informality. These guys are informal and they'll like it. And, you know, I and had, they figured we were going to sell. And it, it probably it, works for it, the it, reader because it makes it more um, usable and readable and you're connectable. We sold a hundred thousand copies or more. And that was just for the first edition. They yeah. had estimated we'd sell eight to 10,000. We were, the first printing was sold out in like six weeks. That's right. uh, and in fact, there was a period of time, the second printing came out without the corrections. He said, no, we don't care. We're just printing 10,000 more. Um, so it was quite a whirlwind. Steve pointed out that it was basically a 320 page business card. Wow. You know, suddenly I'm in, uh, I'm going to CIO meetings, I'm meeting famous people. Uh, I'm traveling around the world, advising governments, uh, I've, I've gone to hard to get into meetings and been invited as the technical, one of the technical people. I shook hands with Bill Clinton when he was president and, and I know a lot of his friends. Um, it has been a remarkable life and it was the book that really did it, but the book did it because Bell Labs lets you do what you want to do. And it turns out us self-starters, I did good stuff. That's great. So that's that's great. Um, so let's let's go back to the farm then now. Like so, tell us about your. Oh, okay. Where you're All right. Going. So, so What's my wife farm? is a botanist. She she's a botanist. She's a plant person. She's also uh, has a medical background, and she um, 
for 25 years, we lived in Bernardsville in a tree shaded north side of a mountain where there was no light. So her plants wouldn't get sunlight. Mm. She said, I want sunlight. So we spent two years looking at farms around here in New Jersey and finally found a lovely one out here in Flemington, not very far from the circle, next to a river between two train, next to two train tracks. It's 60 acres, about 40 of those acres are wetlands. So it's a tick farm. Wow. Um, <laughs> and yeah. uh, she raises bees and we have a few chickens and lots of very unusual plants. But you know, most people say, oh, there's a bush. No, no, that is a special bush from someplace and it has special properties and I don't know. A lot of the bushes are for the bees. Interesting. Um, now, so, so you, you, you talked about your current interest in terms of the train and the freight train that's going yeah, by. I yeah. also know that you fly drones. So t tell us about well, that. Well, I haven't, I, 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 I'm on my third drone now. Um, we fly it around the farm. Well, that isn't strictly true. We've, we've done other stuff, but uh, you know, it's a great way to get a view of the flowers and the farm. And I have some magnificent pictures of the farm. You know, you look outside and you see fall colors on the trees. And I say, you know, if there were a picture from about 400 feet up that way down, it would be gorgeous. And it is. It is. Yeah. Um, I have another one that is the winter time. There's snow all around. Turned on all the outside lights of the house and put the drone up so you could see the house and Flemington off in the distance. That's so great. That was wonderful stuff. Also, we have a Tesla and I like road trips. As a kid, we never took road trips. My dad said it's all just geography. So didn't get around much. I fixed that. <laughs> um, you know, last time I looked, I've been in something close to 40 countries and all but one state. Um, I've flown over Alaska, but I haven't been in it. Uh, but I've been known to hop in the car and drive places. And when I do, I pack the drone. So I have drone shots in, you know, various places of interest. Um, did this early enough that in some places the rules weren't there yet. I really wish I'd done it at Canyonlands. Um, but by then they had rules you weren't supposed to fly drones there. And so I didn't. But, um, yeah, now there's much more regulations. Of it. No, it's, uh, there, there are. There are. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, being on the cutting edge of technology, uh, you're often ahead of the law. And this was certainly true with my Internet work. There were things I was doing on the Internet, various probes and tests and stuff. And I said, you know, there's no law against this. Is this ethical? Mm. You know, Leviticus doesn't talk about sending ping packets to Finland um, or Iran or, or mapping some country's <laughs> network. You know, it, and is this an act of war? Well, I'm just a guy with a computer. Um, and there are a couple of occasions where uh, some district attorney, some ADA, uh, has said, well, you, you might be, it might be fair to call you an unindicted co-conspirator on this. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I kept my hands clean, but there's a lot you could do on the internet and uh, you can be quite anonymous. And in the early days, there were no laws. I mean, there, there were congressmen saying, what should we do about it? They'd ask me, what should we do about it? And it's, the, the answers are hard. Yeah. Uh, so you what's, know, your favorite, what's your favorite place where you've um, used your drone and gotten like really some interesting. Oh, things. let's see. Um, you know, I don't know if any of them really stand out. I've been at the Jersey Shore. I've been in Southern California. Um, I, I don't have anything that's really stunning or amazing. You know, most of the trips that I really love were not drone trips. Uh, you know, New Zealand's an amazing country. So is Australia. Yeah. Uh, you know, even the bureaucrats have a sense of humor in Australia. Um, been to Europe many times. My daughter lives in Nottingham, England. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to get over there when we can. I don't know what's going to happen there. So we travel, my wife and I travel a lot. Well, we have. Now we just stay right here and go to the store every once in a while. In New Jersey. So, you know, for those Jersey, people, for the young people that are watching this, and even, you know, not so young, yeah. they're thinking, okay, I want to do something in computers. I want to you know, either discover something or do research. What, what, what would you recommend? What do you think is needed? Okay, I have, what would you I have two answers for this. Go okay, I, I have two answers for this. First of all, something I tell the kids, and this is all the way up to teenagers, is what is the question they get so much? What do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, there's something like 150,000 answers to that. So 
I, what I tell them is turn it around and ask the grown up, what did you want to be when you were nine years old? And I ask this question all over the place because you get, I mean, you get firemen and stuff. Um, I have found the ladies behind the desk at a medical place, a doctor's office, the ones who know all the, the um, insurance codes and stuff, a lot of them wanted to be high school teachers. Mm. Well, right. You know, for me, if you'd asked me, I would have said chemist. The job I actually ended up with was internet researcher, which didn't exist. Right. Um, so, so what you do is you have to ask people what they love about their job and try to zero in on that. Um, so if somebody so asked that, you, what, what do you love about your job? So if somebody was thinking about going into the field well, of so internet I, security I, uh, or anything, what, what did you love about it? Well, so I, I love to program. You know, I'm retired. I've got, I saved money. My wife and I saved and invested money. We have enough that we can afford a farm and so on. I could spend all day watching Netflix if I wanted to. <laughs> I don't want to, but if I did, I could do that. Uh, but instead, I'm writing computer programs. I must really like writing computer programs. Writing a computer program is an act of science and math, but there's also artistry. And there's, you, um, I mean, you have to know algorithms and all that sort of stuff. But there's also, it's a creation. You're making a machine, really, when you write a program. It's not sitting there with gears, but it's something in a computer that does stuff. It can be hugely complicated. <coughs> and uh, oh, here we go. Hugely complicated. And in fact, one of the biggest problems with programs is controlling the complication because it's easy to keep adding, festooning it with so much stuff that it goes. I still love doing that. Um, the internet security was time and place. You know, I was at Bell Labs, I was running a firewall, I was changing it and adding it, I was learning all this stuff. The internet had a few thousand computers on it. It's a big experiment. Thank you all for playing. You know, now there's about 4 billion addresses in use. Oh my God. Um, that's also another thing to look for is an industry or area that's growing. Mm -hmm. It's better to be in a growing business than in the buggy whip business because they're not, it's not growing. So find companies and in, in, industries or things that are growing. Now the other, oh, go ahead. Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. All right. So um, I've also picked up a variety of patents over the years. And my nephew said, Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill, how do you get to be an inventor? I said, that's a darn good question, because I would never have told anyone in my first 25 years that I was going to be an inventor. And I had to think about it. And I always like to know how things work. My dad showed me how a toilet worked, and I'd fix toilets, and I'd fix electrical stuff around the house and learn all that sort of thing. But it turns out the more you learn about how things work, the more you might be able to come up with answers to problems you run into. So and you were very, you were very you, curious. You were very curious. I am, I am very curious. Very curious yeah. um, and um, this actually gets to the whole question of patents mm -hmm. and inventions. Inventions are not rare. They're very common. Whether they're worth patenting or going after or who can use them is another question. And I think you, you've talked to Bob about, about that stuff. He has made some very useful inventions. I've made some useful ones. I don't know if they've changed the world. But let me tell you one patent idea I had 10 years ago. Four words, and if you think about it, you'll get it. Color selectable hold music. Color selectable hold music? Hold music. You call a site, you talk, okay, we'll be with you, please hold. Da, 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 da. I don't want this. I don't want your ad. I want, so how about some choices? You could pick. A particular kind of music or silence with an occasional reminder of you've been waiting three minutes or something like that. I've never seen it. It's mostly something a phone company would do, I guess. But as far as I know, it isn't out there and it could be useful. I did hear that on something. There was something where they say you can choose the type of music that you can listen to. I, I have never recall. heard that. But yes, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to remember where I heard that. There was something once and I was like, really? You could, you could choose the music? I have to go back and think not? about it and let you know. Yeah, it's great. Yes, That's especially great. if it's going to be a long and awful wait. Right. This, you could yes. sell this service. I did. I, so I'm going to recall. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So I've got another one I came up with this week. Now, right. obviously, I've, I've learned a lot of math and science and so on. And uh, it's getting towards the end of the naval orange season. Where is he going with this? And uh, about two weeks ago, I brought home a bunch of oranges from our local shop, right? And they were juicy and wonderful. You know, the perfect naval oranges, peeled and wonderful. And I went back to the same bin a week later and got a bunch of them. And they were dry and fibrous. And we basically gave them to the chickens. And I thought, is there some way I could tell if an orange was juicy or not from the outside without buying it? And the answer, I think, I have not run this past anyone, but it's plausible, is sonar. This, the, the microphone and speaker on an iPhone or on smartphones are very yeah. high fidelity, very easy to control. I imagine you could take the orange, put this on here, it would send a ping in there, listen to the echo, and I'll bet the echo from a fibrous orange is different from one with a juicy orange. So you could either, okay, so that's an app. That's pretty easy. People might like that. You could put it in a bag so you're not touching the orange. Um, you could imagine that the quality of the juiciness might, you could make a proprietary index, juicy rating of 10 or zero or something. I'm sorry, we only sell juicy ratings of eight or more. See, this so is what, be, right, but this is what an inventor thinks about in terms of picking out oranges. The first thing that came to mind when you said, I wonder how we can tell from the outside of the orange if it yeah. was Produce Pete. Do you remember Produce Pete? He was on one of the yeah. news. Okay, Produce Pete, I, I, you know, and he's not paying me for mentioning his name, but he, you know, he's uh -huh. from one of the, uh, the, the stations and he would come in and do this segment and he would teach people how to learn if the fruit was good, if this was good. So we'll have to call up produce cool. and ask him about that as well. I love this invention. Uh, you know, that'd be great. It would be an interesting app to write. And you could either do it by looking at the echoes and figuring out what's different. Or nowadays, because you know about this, is machine learning. You yeah. take 100 bad oranges and 100 good oranges and you ping them and you say, here are the signals from 100 bad ones and 100 good ones. You figure out what's important, what make, what's different. Interesting. Um, now, and that, you know, your Chris, iPhone or, yeah. You mentioned, I'm, I'm sorry, you mentioned that you have a daughter and a son. I don't know if you have yes. more. Yes. Um, but did any nope. of the, your kids follow in your footsteps or in your wife's nope. footsteps? Neither one? No, 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 no. I taught them a little programming, but it never really stuck. And frankly, it's hard to figure out what the first language to teach is. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the first language I learned was basic, which is an awful language, but it's not bad for your first month or two. You can do simple things pretty easily. And it's what I show the fourth graders. One of the talks I did for the mentor product project was 50 years of programming, what it looked like 50 years ago and what I do now. And the 50 years ago, it turns out the computer system I used 50 years ago, that software is available on the internet. There is a web page you can go and type the same commands I typed at Lawrenceville in, in the Johnson administration and get the same results. And I did some basic stuff and showed him that. And then I showed him an app I've written and said, you know, this is why I love it and stuff. Um, but I have long had a hard time figuring out what that first language should be. And I'm still not really happy with with the answers. Now, there are people out there who do it. I mean, there's Scratch and Logo. There, there are lots of things there, and some people have done better, I guess. But I, it never clicked with him. Uh, you know, my son funny. was in the restaurant. I'm yeah. sorry, continue. No, what is your yeah. son doing? My son was in the, is, was in the restaurant business. Oh. I don't know what's going to happen now. Restaurant business in New York took a big hit. Yes, My it daughter did. is an essential person in middle management in England in a, a, in a power company. I don't know what she's going to do. Do you want to share? She's, what? she's working every day. What restaurant did your son have? Does he, um, he a restaurant in, in the... He's, he's not here at the moment. Um, there, well, he, he, he worked in several restaurants, uh, fairly high end over the last 15 years and so on. Uh, there's one in Midtown that he was, he, he I, was working on. Yeah, I know, unfortunately, you know, some of the big ones actually closed, like for permanently. Oh, They're the hotel and the restaurant closed and went out of business. So he gets to start over sometime soon. And yeah. he, he's got, he does a pretty good job, as near as I can tell. I don't think he'll have trouble. He has a lot of contacts. But he's starting over. And he's got a kid who's 19 months old. Wow. Now, his wife works for the New York City Education, the Department of Education. She's a teacher. 
She's a math teacher. How cool is that? That's cool. So, you know, the time is just flying by, Chess, and I just want to ask you this. We've, yeah. learned, we've learned so much about you. Um, you know, we learned what, what you think about when you go get oranges. And, uh, but what, if, what, yeah. would pe- what would something be that people would be surprised to learn about you? Is there anything that they would be, people who know you or people who don't know you and are just getting to know you now, what would surprise people about you? Well, it probably wouldn't surprise them that there are a lot of things I don't pick up or notice very much, social cues and so on. You know, I'm not, I don't actually stare at my shoes when I talk at people, with people. Um, but uh, you, you could call me a little bit of an absent-minded professor. I'm not an actual professor. I am absent-minded and I'm terrible with names. Um, on the other hand, I notice things that other people don't notice, usually science or math-based. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, Christmas decorations. You got a pole, you got the lights on the pole spiraling around it. I always know whether it's a left-handed or right-handed spiral. Interesting. I think the people, the people who put the lights up probably don't notice left or right-handed, but I notice it all the time. I notice it on unicorn horns. If you go to the cloisters and see the unicorn tapestries, Mm -hmm. five of the six unicorns have a spiral one way and the other one has a spiral the other way. How many people have noticed that in the history of the unicorn tapestries? Wow, I, I, I don't know. That would be I mean, it's to sort of a out. stupid yeah. thing. I actually showed the fourth graders this. I don't know if they actually got the idea, but this all boils down to something called chirality, and it's really important in chemistry. So I think you know what? I guess if you've noticed it, you can all go, you can go to the Mentor Project, mentorproject.org, and there's an Ask the Mentor section, and you can type in if you're sure. one of the people that also notice that. And I think that you might want to follow the same track as Chez. That might be like one of those yeah. things if you could be gifted in something that, you know, a natural yeah. gift if you could um, notice which way. So one of the talks I give to high school kids is I give my biography, not because I'm such a great guy, but because it's so cotton pick and random. And, you know, you got to look for what is it you like to do? Where do you like to be? And so on. You know, if you want to marry a redhead, go to a city where there are lots of redheads. Uh, <laughs> it, it, these are sort of general things you do, and then the rest just happens. And you sort of listen to what you like and don't like. Um, you know, there's no way, if you'd asked me when I was a student at Lehigh, that are you going to go to Bell Labs? Oh, God, no, those are geniuses. Oh, God, that's, that's, that's never happened. But I not only got there, but I'm proud to say I did good stuff there. That's great. And that was not at all necessarily true either, you know? Here it is, guy. There's no excuse. They're paying you. They'll buy you stuff. Go do something. So what would you say that kids, teenagers, young adults, adults should look for in a mentor? Oh, I don't know. You know, um, okay, so I'm not sure the answer to that, but one of the answers is to learn from a lot of different people. And in fact, this is a mistake I think my daughter made. She has a wide range of interests and she went to Edinburgh, Mm -hmm. uh, the University of Edinburgh. And the universities in the UK, you read in a particular subject. You you have fairly narrow focus. They're superb quality and so on. Um, For me, it's better the American university where you take five or seven different courses that are widespread for me in sciences means that you're getting a taste of a lot of different stuff. And one of the sciences I didn't care about at all when I got to Lehigh was geology. And I ran into a geology professor who was amazing. And I'm a big fan of geology now. So it's one of the sciences I follow. Um, And I think leaving yourself open to that and not sort of prejudging that's boring. Um, And it's a good idea to ask if you're going into college Ask someone who's a senior there, first of all, who are the best teachers? Who are the ones you want to learn from? And secondly, I want to be a doctor. Okay, so I have to take pre-med. Okay, what's the hardest course in pre-med? Well, the answer turns out to be, for most people, organic chemistry. And I, for me, it was a math course in linear algebra. I just kept taking it over and over again. I could not get it. And I learned that that was stupid. I, what I should have done after I realized I'm not getting along with this teacher, I kept getting the same teacher, we didn't click, 
It was the opposite of a mentor. I was not, I had done well in math and calculus and stuff. I understood what's going on. I still do. I helped my daughter with her calculus homework 20 years ago. Um, but I couldn't get this and I'm still having trouble with it. I'm going to spend some retirement time on it. And what I needed to do and should have asked my father for some money is I need a tutor. Hire me a grad student that I can sit in a room, you know, for three hours a day for two weeks and we'll go through the whole course. One you know, on that, one. That is so important for people to hear because you're so accomplished and so brilliant and you yet struggled in certain areas and you needed tutoring or you, you know, could have been. I, I did and I never got it. Right, and I'm right. still weak in that. And uh, it turns out my nephew had some problems and I told my sister about this and she could afford and brought in tutors. And you know, part of it was I didn't like to do homework. I wanted to go do my own thing. And you know, you're not doing your own thing when you're sitting in the classroom and someone's saying, okay, we're going to do this matrix now and the determinants. And, and actually you have no choice. And my best classes were the summer school classes. Uh, one of the classes I took was EE20, the electrical engineering. It was a killer class in the electrical engineering school that made a lot of business majors. And I took it for those five weeks and it was three hours a day for five weeks and it was fascinating and I totally aced it. I totally got it. I still remember most of it. And it was the concentrated learning. That was what worked for me. That's Not great. this thing spread out over 14 weeks, a few times a week, but really yeah. focused. And, and so you learning that is very helpful. Right. And you learn the way you learned. And we were just talking about this on, you know, another yeah. interview. And, and so, you know, it's so, inter it's so important to know the way you learn and what works for you. And I also want to just yeah, add something hard. about, yeah, add about tutoring, because I know mm -hmm. I work, I teach at a community college, I'm an adjunct, and they give free tutoring. And, you know, there are people that believe that tutoring are just if you're struggling or it's for, you know, people who are stupid. But, you know, I always say, most people get tutoring. It's a privilege. And if, and they offer it. it is. So I tell my students, it's free here. Go get tutoring in every single subject because it can be amazing for you. And I, it's a misnomer, I, yeah. you know, because so many of, of, the, of the, the students that go to really good school, they've been tutored all their lives because they had the privilege yeah. of having that. So I'm a big fan yeah. of, of taking advantage of everything that you have. You know, that you can it's one-on-one -on -one teaching. It's just yeah. like the other teaching is that you are focused and you're going to learn. Right. And, you know, I had a French teacher at Lawrenceville who offered to tutor me in French and I didn't take him up on it. What a dummy. Oh, <laughs> and you know, the other thing is that some of the best tutoring in, in sciences and math can come from grad students who are starving. Yeah. You know, they would love to earn, I don't know what the right number is. Uh, it might be 20 or 50 bucks an hour. They'd love to do that to go through this stuff. And well, yeah. Because this has been amazing. And I know that the mentor project is just so lucky to have you as a mentor. And before we go, I think you have a drone. Do you have the drone in your room right there? Is there a drone in? Yeah, you want me to bring it over? Yeah, we want to see it. I want to see it. I'm sure the audience. Oh, okay. See it too. Let's see it. Uh, this, this is the tech room. I took, it used to be a nice hunter room or something for the previous owners. Now it's full of computers and desks and, and tools and an exercise bike. It's actually where I do my Oculus Quest in here. This is a DJI Pro 3, which is actually a little old, yeah. but it's got nice video. Um, you can fly it for 18 minutes. 18 minutes is a long time to be in the air. These are new propellers. I, I destroyed one set when I, it turns out you don't want to go sideways when you're not looking where you're going. You run into trees. And so I use this sometimes. Very cool. Uh, also, my granddaughter loves it. Oh, the battery is completely dead. Anyway, that's the that's drone. Great. That's great. And I'm sure uh, people who haven't yeah. seen it will appreciate that. I know I'm, I'm a side drone lover, so I, I, I don't have one. Uh -huh. but I, I follow them. So uh, it's, in, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So this has just been great. Thank you so much, Chez. This has just been- My pleasure. Great. And I, I hope to get a chance to talk to you again and we'll have you back on. And I know that- Sure. What people are going to have the um, really the privilege of seeing is some of your lectures right now as well, and we'll probably have you back to do more mentoring and lecturing. Yeah, and uh, cool. I just want to thank you for being here. And again, to our viewers, again, you can go to mentorproject.org, and there is Chez's mentoring, an hour with a mentor, and you'll be able to watch this there as well. 
and um, ask any of your questions. Again, you can ask a mentor. So you can ask Ches sure. anything you want on that. So Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you again. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time uh, here at the Mentor Project. And again, I'm Dr. Susan. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Be safe, everybody. <laughs>